Hello everyone, my name is Francisco. I am one of the developers of AIDA Core here at EPFL. And in this video, I will show you a general introduction and overview to the code. So first, I'm going to give you a bit of context and talk about the motivation behind the development of AIDA. And afterwards, we're going to go a bit into the code itself and how to use it. So most of you are already familiar with the exponential rate at which computational power has increased over the last years. Nowadays, we are actually at the verge of achieving speeds that are in the order of the exaflops. This, in turn, has allowed computational scientists to continually expand the horizons of their research, both in the precision of the results and in their sampling capabilities. And the material science community, from where we come from, has been particularly interested in these advances and in tackling the obstacles that come with them. So, one of these problems that is actually uh, more widespread throughout the whole scientific, uh, the whole range of scientific disciplines, and which is particularly important to understand AIDA, is the notorious reproducibility crisis. And reproducibility is one of the corner stores of the scientific method, so this is not something to take lightly. It is easy to understand how this could be a problem in real life experiments. This is because it is extremely difficult to have control over all possible variables that might be relevant. But uh, computational scientists, however, have much more control over the environment of their simulations. So why is this a problem for us too? And to understand this, we first need to analyze and model how is the process of doing computational research. And for this, we will use what we call a provenance model, uh, which in this case will represent the whole process uh, as a graph of nodes. And we will see that this representation will not only help us to understand the problem, but will also help us uh, when we're trying to solve it. And we will start, since part of our job is dealing with different pieces of information, we will represent this as contained inside of nodes that we will call data nodes. And as you can see, these nodes uh, may contain, for example, a list of atomic positions uh, that are the input for a molecular dynamic of the set of parameters for the code that we will use to do this dynamic. And <coughs> And then the way we use this information is we transform it. We take an initial geometry and the list of inputs, we run the code and we obtain the relaxed geometry or a trajectory, so another piece of information. And the transformation of the self will be represented by these calculation nodes, whereas the whole process of transforming one data into another will be displayed by connecting the data nodes of the calculation nodes uh, and the data nodes with directed lines. The direction of these links will depend on whether the data was used or produced during the calculation. So this would be a single step of computational research and what it would look like represented this way. We see that the transformation of some initial data D1 into an output data D2 through the process calculation of C1. And it is important to note that there is information not only inside of the data nodes, data nodes, but also on the links. And this information is about the relationship between the different pieces of data. Now, this is only a single step, but a scientific process or a scientific workflow will involve several of these steps. And many of them will be operating over data created by its predecessors, as here is doing. C2 over D2. Then it becomes more evident how there is information on the links as the same node, in this case D2, can act both as an output to the calculation C1 and also as an input to calculation C2. This then has to be considered when we are organizing our information. So, uh, because when we do so, we normally use the architecture available to us in our computers. That is, in this case, the folder system. 
However, this system is not particularly well suited to store the information of the connectivity. And typically, we will have information of the data nodes inside files, but there are no calculation files. The calculations are just codes we execute or commands we run. So, for example, one way in which many of us try to keep the information that two data nodes are connected through a calculation node is by making one folder per calculation and keeping there all the inputs and the outputs. So we can imagine that for a typical two-step workflow that consists on first generating some data and then analyzing it, one would end up uh, with these two folders. The problem here is that while they do keep the link given by the calculation, they each need to have a copy of the file that contains the data D2. Hence, what we lose here is the connection between these two steps given by the output of them being used as an input by the other. In this minimal case, it might seem trivial to remember that these two folders correspond to consecutive steps, or even we can use sim links instead of copying the files. But as workflows become more elaborate, then the workload on our memory and on the extra upkeep necessary to keep uh, this information manually becomes just too much. And real life scientific workflows look like this. So as you can see here, uh, these are the steps, all the steps involved in calculating a single property for a single material. Here is a zoom window so you can get a better idea of the scale of this graph. And now it is easy to understand how high throughput projects require multiple properties calculated for thousands of materials will would compound on this issue. So it is incredibly difficult to keep track of all of these connections manually. We need a tool that will help us keep track of the full provenance graph. So this is how, what has become one of our main focuses in developing AIDA as a software to support high throughput projects. Uh, and with that in mind, Let's take a look now at the system itself and how it works. So, the first question is, what exactly is AIDA? And AIDA is a Python library that you can pip install in your working machine and will provide you with a set of tools to use for doing your research work. Uh, as users, you typically handle these tools either through a command line interface called Verdi or a Python ORM to be used either while writing script files or to a Python shell. Uh, we will now see how to handle this. And when you use these tools, you will be able to easily manage your calculations irrespective of where they are running, either locally or in a remote machine. And AIDA will also keep uh, track of the provenance for your work automatically. Uh, here we can see how the different functions of AIDA are organized internally. On the right, uh, you have the different interfaces you can use to interact with the AIDA installation. And you can see both the ORM and the command line, but there are some other options as well. On the left, you can see uh, the engine that is in charge of managing the demons that run in the background and keep track of your active calculations. And finally, there's also, it is also relevant to mention here below, the internal storage consisting of a file repository and an internal database where all the information of the provenance is stored. So these are the pieces of the puzzle, but then how, this, how does it work? Or more specifically, how does one work with this? <coughs> so, okay, let's take a look at this very simple procedure. Uh, we start with this initial piece of information, this initial data, the number 10 stored in our variable data zero. And we run two calculations or transformations on it. The first one is to multiply it times two and the second one to add one. Very simple procedure. And you can run the script like this and maybe print the result to a file to be used later for other processes or keep it in a different fashion, but we have seen before it is very easy to lose track of where this value of 21 came from. So the solution with AIDA is that by introducing some simple adaptations that I will now explain uh, into the script, 
we can now run with AIDA in a way that will keep the provenance of this two-step procedure. And so if we run this with AIDA using the command line tool, we call Verdi run with the name of the script and AIDA will start processing it. So the first thing that it does after reading the definitions is to create an initial data node as indicated here to Python by using the AIDA ORM type to store integers. And you can see that when it creates the node in the database, it assigns it an ID number to it, and we will see later why this matters. But then the next step uh, is to use this initial data node as an input to our first calculation times two. And you can see that the calc function decorator in the definition is indicating to AIDA that it needs to keep track of the provenance by connecting the inputs and outputs of this function through a calculation node. Again, note that it assigns a different ID number to every node it creates. And finally, it calls the last function and generates the last calculation and final output. Uh, this works exactly as with the previous calculation. So finally, uh, the script finishes and our database will have kept the record of all the transformations that turned our initial value inside of node data zero into our final value stored in node data two. Now, the thing is that all of these nodes are kept inside AIDA's internal database. So the user does not directly see uh, any of this content. So the program also provides a series of tools to explore the content of your database. So for example, you can ask AIDA to list all the calculations that it has uh, recorded by running this command, verdi process list, and expose the information about the two calculation nodes we just run. So we had their ID numbers, their label, which here will allow us to identify each of them, and their state, which in this case is finished successfully for both of them. Uh, during this tutorial, you will learn how to run different calculations, how to read this status, but uh, we just now focus on this, and if we wanted more details for one of them, we could take, say, node two, for example, <coughs> and we could run Verdi process show with that ID. And now we get even more information, including which are the inputs and the outputs and what are their IDs. So again, uh, we also have a command that allows us to check the values stored inside of these data nodes, referenced by their ID numbers. And also finally, in this case, we can obtain information about the process that this nodes underwent, because even if you lose the script file or you don't remember what the definition associated with this uh, calculation node is, uh, you can see that the information is stored inside of the calculation node itself. So you can always know that it's uh, what this process involved. Now, hopefully this gives you a bit of an overview of how it is like to work with AIDA and how to use the ORM scripts and how to use the command line interface to run the scripts and to query the database. And know that what we just did here with Python functions can also be adapted to use almost any kind of external code, external program, only that instead of using a decorator, you will need to set up the information of how the code works in a way that AIDA can understand it. In other words, you will have to implement what is called a calculation plugin. So AIDA course, this AIDA score distribution is built as an easy to expand base that you can use to create wrappers uh, around almost any external code. So you can use almost any external code this way by doing a plugin, a calculation plugin. But calculations are not the only aspect of AIDA that you can expand and customize. Uh, you can see that there are many other types of plugin, and the best type, uh, the best part about this is that you might actually don't need to create yourself your own plugins, uh, because AIDA also fosters a community of plugin developers. So these are people who design plugins uh, to deal with very well-known codes or very common data structures which are then gathered into pip installable packages and published in the AIDA plugin registry. 
Uh, in this tutorial, you will be running quantum field simulation, and you will actually do so through one of the plugins specifically, specifically designed to interact with that code. Uh, we are not going to go through all of the plugins now, but I do want to introduce you uh, to one last important concept, and that is uh, the one of workflows. Because uh, we already mentioned workflows more colloquially uh, in the intro when we talked about the scientific workflows and analyzed what they look like. So you already know that if you want to take a material and compute the band structure for it, there are a lot of steps involved. And I already showed you how AIDA can automatically keep track this linked information for you. But it can actually do a bit more than that. So there is no need for you to manually do each of these steps uh, that are pictured here. And this, of course, might already be apparent to you because uh, when we saw how to work with AIDA, we wrote our two-step mini workflow in a script. So it is natural to think, okay, why can't we do a script that does this whole workflow now? And <clears throat> indeed, this is possible uh, with the tools that we have already saw. And it's not only possible, but also extremely valuable. Because not only does this make it easier to apply the workflow, both for reproducibility purposes, but also to repeat it uh, and apply it to different inputs, but it also allows to hide both the computational and the scientific expertise or know-how from the end user, making this into a tool that you can now offer to a wider audience. We call these tools uh, turnkey solutions, as you just you can just plug them in and turn them on, and it, they just should they, they just work. Moreover, in AIDA, we support the design of workflows to the implementation of a specialized type of node. So how does that work? Uh, let's first analyze how one would go about doing this uh, normally. You can imagine taking the procedure that we used before here. Uh, here in the right is what we used before, and then wrap it around the function here on the left that can more easily be re uh, reused. So if we were to run this new script with AIDA, then uh, we would obtain the exact same provenance as before, as is expected. But again, with some simple modifications in the way that uh, the script works, in this case, just a single decorator. And we can indicate to AIDA that this function is defining a cohesive procedure. And so when we run this one, it will reflect uh, this uh, cohesiveness by connecting the initial and final nodes as well as both calculations used to a controlling workflow node. This way, not only does the origin of each of your results can be traced back to the data provenance, but also there is a logical provenance, in this case uh, represented by the workflow node, that helps you to understand the bigger picture of your procedures. And so with this, uh, we have now seen all the features that I wanted to show you. So to summarize, uh, with AIDA here, you will learn how to use it to locally control your remote resources and keep track of all your calculations directly from your computer. So without having to log in different clusters or copy files around, uh, we will see or, or we have seen how you can work in a way that the data provenance of your results is recorded and you have full traceability for your work. We will expand on this later. And finally, we have just saw how AIDA also supports the implementation of high level workflows and the design of turnkey solutions. So I hope now uh, you have more concrete idea of what AIDA is and how it works in general. <clears throat> Uh, so let me just uh, wrap up by briefly showing you the funding agencies that support this project. Uh, you can also find here at the right some online resources available for you. And finally, this is the people who are currently involved in the, developing, uh, in the development of the code and also former members and active plugin developers. Uh, you will get to know some of these people in the next couple of days. So for now, I thank you for your attention, and I will see you later in our Q&As and hands-on sessions. Goodbye.